Good morning. Thank you for talking back to me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I really mean that. When I say good morning, sometimes it's a little bit good to see this all so quiet. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be with you this morning. Uh, and I have a unique story, and forgive me because uh, I have a unique story, but it's not really about me, it's about the military. But more, more importantly, it's about you, and it's about the country, and it's about what you want to do. Because uh, with all due respect to Dr. Garcia, who's a good friend, and, and myself included, we're kind of at the end of, of it. Not, not of everything, but we're sort of at the end of the spectrum. And the key to the success of wherever we go in the future sits in front of me. Because you see, my relief, a certain general of the Navy, could very well be sitting in this office. Dr. Garcia's relief as the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services is actually sitting right here in front of us right now. The key here is that our success is actually your success. So what I'd like to do is give you a few thoughts that I have that I think are important for you to take with you today. I'd like to give you those thoughts, I'd like to give you some personal comments, and then I'd like to open it up to you so you can ask me questions. My name's Adam Robinson, as the uh, uh, program says. I'm the Surgeon General of the Navy, the 36th. My background in the Navy is Louisville, Kentucky. There's not a lot of water there. There is the Ohio River. There is the Kentucky Derby, and there is the great steamboat race every year. But my exposure to water was not oceans, and it was not vast arrays of ships. It was the Belle of Louisville and the Cincinnati Queen. So how did I get in the Navy? Coming through Indiana University undergraduate school, majoring in political science, 1968 to 1972, I thought that I wanted to go to medical school. My father had been a physician. But I decided that I maybe wanted to do anthropology or I wanted to something else. And the reason I went to medical school is because I got called to go to medical school, much as a, a preacher would be called to preach the gospel. I, I don't want to get wrapped around anything, and I don't want anyone to start turning off. But I will only tell you that I realized, as I was in, med as I was in undergraduate school, that I would never be satisfied, I was going to never be content if I didn't go to medical school. There were three sisters, all in college, myself in college, and a brother who was a senior in high school. My father died when I was a freshman in, in, uh, in uh, college. My brother was a senior. And I needed to get off the family role, as it were, because we didn't have a lot of money. He was a physician, but we still didn't have a lot of money. So I needed to find a way to pay for my medical education. And as I was wandering through the campuses of Bloomington, Indiana, uh, I went by Kirkwood Hall, which is one of the big administration buildings, and out came a guy who had on, not this uniform, but actually a khaki uniform. And we talked, and he said, you know, there's a new program just beginning, the Health Profession Scholarship Program. First year of his existence was 1972, and I was in the first class of those Health Profession Scholars. And so he helped me to, in fact, finance my medical education through Indiana University. So the first thing I want to give you is this. People see me coming and they say, oh, you're recruiting. Well, I guess I'm recruiting, but I don't really think of myself as a recruiter as much as I think of myself as someone that gives you the information that you need to have. Because your success is dependent upon your having a complete listing of the opportunities that are before you, and then you can choose and do what you think you should do, do the right thing for yourself. But you at least need to know that military health system, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, and the Public Health Service, have opportunities for medical education and for undergraduate education that you should avail yourselves of, particularly for the, from the medical school point of view is what I'm talking about. After I finished with my medical education, meaning my medical school, I then had the opportunity to stay at Southern Illinois University, which is where I'd done my uh, internship. I didn't really want to come on active duty is what I'm telling you. I had gone through Indiana University Medical School. I had been a health profession scholar. I had gotten my tuition, my books, my fees, and a stipend paid to me every month. And then I decided that I'd rather stay on the private sector and just stay in Illinois or some other place and practice. But the deal here is, the reason I'm telling you this is, you 
can't do it that way. When you sign, you, you got to deliver. And the way it happened to me is my detailer called me one day and he said, you know, we haven't heard from you. And I said, well, I wasn't planning to come. And he said, you really don't have a choice. And I said, what if I don't? And he said, the U.S. Marshals will come and get you. Which is true. They didn't come and get me because I decided not to push that button. But after that, I then came through, did a general medical officer here in Puerto Rico. After that year, came back to the National Naval Medical Center in, Fort, in uh, uh, Washington, D.C., Bethesda, Maryland, and did my general surgery residency. And after my general surgery residency in 1982, I went to Japan, and I was at the Coast Naval Hospital and also in US, USS Midway, where I was ship surgeon. After I did my Japan tour, I came back and did a fellowship in colon and rectal surgery at Carl Foundation Clinic in Champaign-Urbana, which is the University of Illinois affiliated facility. And after I finished that, came back to Bethesda and continued on my colon and rectal surgery. Now, for those of you who are looking at me and you're saying, oh my goodness, I, I don't want to do the military. I want to, I want to practice and do surgery. I want you to know something. The vast number of years, I've been in the Navy 31 years, 22 of those 31 years was doing surgery and teaching and training residents to do surgery. So it wasn't doing the Surgeon General and this executive medicine that I've been doing now. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing now, but this is a very small part of what my existence has been in military medicine. It's mainly been in taking care of patients and families. In military medicine, our, our definition and concept of care is patient and family centered. People often say to me, well, what do you mean by that? And what's this concept of care business? Well, here's what I mean by that. Medicine is always local, make no mistake about it. It is as local as any politics that you will ever be involved in. Medicine is not about being out there in some far off place or doing something distant from your patient. Medicine is about you as a provider being with a patient and personally getting to know them and being involved in them and in their lives and in their families so that you can help them through the treacherous times and the difficult times in their life. It is about being there for individuals in a very personal and a real way. In the Navy, Navy medicine does the same thing that you do anywhere else, except I think we do it better than most places. What's the difference between Navy medicine and American medicine? It's not in the quality of care, because quality of care is good both places once you get the access. It's about not having to coordinate your care. You see, in the private sector, you have to coordinate your care. You as potential and future medical professionals need to know that a lot of what American people don't care for in medicine is not always about cost. It's also about having someone to help you go through the process of getting the care that you need. You do not need to coordinate your own care. Someone should be there to help you through that. That someone traditionally has been what we call a physician. If you don't want to call a physician anymore and you want to say provider, nothing wrong with that, then the provider. But what is wrong is to start a patient on a course of therapy and not help a patient get through that course of therapy completely. And also to bring their family with them so that everyone understands what's happening. So that's what patient and family-centered care is in the Navy. We don't allow people to go out on their own. We coordinate care. We coordinate the care on warrior, warriors coming back from Iraq or Afghanistan. We coordinate care on the neonate that's born at 25 weeks in the neonatology unit at Portsmouth or at a National Naval Medical Center. We take care of those families. This isn't about just taking care of the patient or the military member. This is about making and ensuring that everyone in the family is cared for and that their needs are met. Back to me, just in terms of my goal. As I've gone through Navy medicine, one of the joys that I've had was in 1998 to take a fleet hospital to Haiti. Uh, in 1998, Many of you may remember, many of you may be too young to remember, but in the mid-90s, uh, the United States invaded Haiti, uh, overthrew the government, uh, helped to change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. During that whole process, uh, the American military and the uh, American medical, military medical establishment went into Haiti, and what we found is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere that is in 
absolute dire need of every resource that we can give. So in that six-month period of time that I was there with Fleet Hospital, we saw about 25, 26,000 Haitian nationals doing humanitarian assistance mission. We were able to, in fact, help with those families and give care, and it was one of the most uh, exhilarating and defining missions that any of us from a medical point of view have been on. Finding in this regard, the first thing is we had never been seen, we had never had the opportunity to see a three and 4,000 people descend upon approximately 250 foremen, doctors, nurses, and other health professionals to get care. The second thing is we saw everything. There's no disease that you can name that we didn't see. Leprosy, malaria, cancer, HIV, uh, anything, all, all the infectious diseases all the parasitic diseases, schistosomiasis, uh, everything you can imagine we would see. And the third thing is this. We had to give the care that we were capable of giving or the patients needed there. In other words, it wasn't about, well, I'm sorry, your case is too much for here. Why don't you make an appointment and see me Thursday? So as a surgeon, I operated under trees, and I operated in all sorts of different conditions. And the reason was, if I didn't do what I needed to do then, patients didn't get it, so they either died or they went ahead, but there was no second chances. What we found was that military medicine, with all of its talk about war and about warrior care, and by the way, uh, I'm not shying away from that. Uh, I'm a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. That's what we do. But we also do something else, and there's a new dimension, and you need to know this, and it's a real dimension, and it is a strategic imperative at the highest levels of our government, and that's called humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, because what we in the United States have found is that we have no problem in winning the war, but we often find ourselves having a great deal of difficulty in winning the peace. And what we found is with the soft power of medical care through humanitarian assistance, we can do more in terms of winning the hearts and the minds, but also making a difference in people's lives on a very personal way by delivering the care that we can to them in their own in their own homes, meaning in their own terrain and in their own areas. So that tour I had in Haiti was a really a defining tour. And since that time, the United States has embarked upon a multiple humanitarian assistance mission involving both the USNS Comfort, the USNS Mercy, and the USS Kearsars, the USS, um, many other LHAs and LPHs that have gone forward to make sure that we can give care. Uh, I'd like to end this particular portion uh, on, a, on a couple of notes that I think are important. Number one, should you join the military? I don't know. That's your decision. But you need to know what military medicine has to offer. And the only thing that I ask you to do is don't decide you don't want to do something you have the full facts about what, the, what it can do for you and for your family. So you need to have that information. Number two, can you be successful? Are you going to be successful? I have no idea. You're the people that will make your own success. Uh, you cannot be limited by test scores. You cannot be limited by anyone telling you you can or cannot do things. You have to go forward. If you don't get into medical school the first time, you have to apply again. If you need to get more training, if you need refresher training, Remedial training, go ahead and get that because that's going to get you in medical school. Number three, what does it take to be successful? I think it takes three things. I just told a high school group, and I'm going to tell you. I think it takes professional competence. That's getting prepared. That is getting an education. That is doing whatever you need to from a professional point of view. I think that that is making sure that you're personally prepared. Personally prepared means that you take care of family and those things that mean a lot to you as individuals. And if you think that that gets scheduled because you just think it's going to happen, you're wrong. If you don't put that in your day and if you don't plan for it, it will not happen. And the last thing you need to do is be spiritually aware and awake. And that means this. It means to, that you need to know that there is something in life larger than you, and you need to make sure that you are paying attention to that because it is not all about you or it is not all about me. It is all about other things. It's all about us. And that's why humanitarian assistance particularly from my medical professional's point of view, makes such a huge difference. 
the last thing is this, service. This is a great country. This is a great state. This is a great city. One of the things that makes it great are you. One of the ways that we continue to be great is to make sure that we individually give back something of ourselves to our communities. Now, you can put this uniform on, and you can certainly serve in that capacity. But you can also serve on the local, on the state, on the national level. You can serve by volunteering. You can serve by joining the AmeriCorps or the Peace Corps. You can serve by joining the Public Health Service or many other activities or agencies. But the key is that if you need to make sure that you are giving back something of what you have gotten from this country and from your communities. And if you do that, it's not only going to improve your life and make you a more grounded and a better person, but the big thing is it's going to make our nation highly successful. Now with that, I'd like to stop and offer up an opportunity for you to ask me questions. Uh, I have several people in the room as you look around that are going to be at the fairs this afternoon. Uh, one of them is my uh, aide there, Lieutenant Hall. Lieutenant, would you raise your hand, please? He's taking notes. He's keeping an eye on everyone. He'll have your name. That's particularly true if you ask me questions too hard. Uh, if, in fact, you want to get in touch with me, the people around the room can help you do that. I also have cards. But what I want to do is, if, and by the way, if there's an answer that I don't know, please, someone around the room, please, I, I don't mind sharing this because I don't know all the answers. But with that said, I'm going to open it up to you. So what questions do you have? Yes, sir. The question is, uh, how long is the obligation if you decide to go to, uh, if you decide to become through the Health Profession Scholarship Program? And the second thing is, what is your rank when you come in? The obligation if you do the four-year period is usually about four years. It's usually year for year. That varies. It depends on the amount of postgraduate time that you give, et cetera. So that can go up and down. But, but to answer your question in general, it's a four-year obligation. The rank that you come in with from uh, the Navy's point of view is called lieutenant, which is the same as a captain in the Air Force and the Army. It's, it's what's called an O3, which would be a lieutenant. Yes. The question is, if your prior service, will that be taken in consideration? The quick answer is yes, absolutely, that will be taken in consideration. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The question is, is the humanitarian and assistance and disaster relief an actual program, or is it something that you do? It's actually, I'm going to answer it this way, it's actually both. But the key here is that humanitarian assistance and disaster relief are actually talked about at colleges and universities and medical schools. There are, there are places that, including the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences, that have departments that deal with disaster medicine. So the, the answer is, from an academic point of view, that actually is a discipline that's growing and it's growing very quickly. Uh, from, a, from a military point of view, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, particularly from the Navy's perspective, has become a strategic imperative. And the reason for that is, it, and it's something that we do, it's physicians, nurses, dentists, medical service corps, optometrists, uh, podiatrists, all sorts that get together. One of the reasons that we do that in the Navy is because we have platforms, we have places that can go in and hospitals that can actually go into areas, and so we are self-sufficient as we go in. Normally, when you go in into a disaster or into a ravaged nation or a nation that needs humanitarian assistance, the infrastructure is either a very weak or it may not even be existent, so you're going to have to come in with a, with a stable base. So the Navy can do that. Do that. Army and Air Force can also do that, but they, can, they cannot do it nearly as flexibly and as agile as the Navy because we have ships. By the way, we employ, this isn't just a Navy operation, we employ Army and Air Force, we also employ public health service, we also employ non-government organizations, NGOs, that
that usually are indigenous to that particular country to come in and to help us do these things. So it's not, it is not a, a, a military effort alone. It's actually a partnership with multiple The question is, are you required to train in a military facility for internship and residency? And the, the short answer is no, but normally you will. Uh, and you'll find that most people, as you get through, when you go, come into our system, most people want to train with us because our, our quality of training is that good. However, that, that is not necessarily the case. As I just said, I, I went out to service to do a call and record fellowship. So we send people out service every year for a variety of different residences and a variety of different medical training. Yes, ma'am. And then I'll get to you. The question is, when we travel to an, an area that in which we've been in conflict, the area has been in conflict with the U.S., how are we received? I'll answer that by telling you that in Banda Aceh, Indonesia, when the tsunami came through several years ago, there were, uh, the United States had probably the lowest ratings of any, of any country in terms of, of population. In other words, if you polled the population, what do you think of the United States of America? And it was very, very low ratings. After the uh, USNS Mercy came in, those were the highest ratings that the country had seen in, uh, in a decade. Uh, and the answer to your question is, uh, medic medicine is like music. Uh, it transcends um, all sorts of cultural boundaries and language difficulties. Uh, medicine is, and, and medicine is really a universal language, very much like music is. So the great jazz and, and the great musical ambassadors from the United States have gone into different countries uh, throughout the Cold War and other eras. That same phenomenon occurs with medicine. I'm not telling you that there's not cultural and social aspects to how you apply the care. So you have to be culturally sensitive and you have to be linguistically sensitive. There are all sorts of things you really have to keep in mind. But when you're there doing the right thing for people and you're not there with a political agenda, and I'll, I will assure you from a humanitarian assistance viewpoint, we are not there with a political agenda other than to help. Uh, we are we are well received, and, and this is repeated throughout. This is repeated over and over and over again. It truly is a way to to make a difference, a very positive difference, in not only people's lives but how they view our country. But it's also an opportunity to give uh, superior medical care. The question is: Does the military provide cultural sensitivity training? And the answer is yes. As a matter of fact, the military probably does more of that than most other places that you'll go. Now, I know that sounds a little strange because we often go in conflict, but you see, even in conflict, we need to know who we're fighting. So the answer to the question is uh, yes, we do offer that, and yes, that is a part of what we do, both from a language perspective and also from a religious perspective and a cultural perspective. Talking Louisville, Kentucky. Yes. yes. The, the question is uh, first of all, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and, and the young man here is saying that there's a huge gap in disparities, the racial racial disparities in terms of care between West Louisville and East Louisville. I was born and raised in West Louisville. Uh, and that is, in fact, true. Now, I haven't been in Louisville in many years, but yes, that, that used to be true, and probably it still is. East side was uh, generally a much more affluent and a, and a much more richer side than the West side. With that said, is there anything being, being done to address that? I think that there is something being done to address it across the United States. The Institute of Medicine came out with its racial disparities.
charity uh, profiles and, and, uh, and, and actually highlighted that approximately 10 years ago when, in, when the Great Institute of Medicine report. Uh, last week I was with the Congressional Black Caucus on Capitol Hill and, and actually talked about racial disparities that are going on. One of the issues that, is, that, has, uh, that has struck me is that there is a great deal of discussion about racial disparity and it has, it has actually gone down into a discussion of cultural and social sensitivity and racial sensitivity in a way that this country, in my opinion, hasn't done prior to this. Uh, I think that we are trying to address it, but the key here is that there's still a huge gap that, that is, uh, is in fact there. Now, here's what I think that the world is going to happen so that you'll, you'll secure my view. I think you, I'm talking about you people right here, you, you individuals, you're going to change that uh, over the course of the next several decades. Uh, the first of all, 55% of women medical school now is a huge, huge difference from when I went to medical school 40 years or 35 years ago. That's number one. Number two, demographics of the country is changing rapidly. By 2050, um, majority is going to be minority. The minority is going to be the second minority. Are you with me? Uh, the color is going to change, right? Uh, people of color are going to be people of majority. Uh, people are thinking differently. You're going to change that. And what I mean is, I don't, I don't mean that there's not an issue, but I, I'm telling you that's rolling out. Part of the reason that I'm here is that the United States Navy is very, is very much afraid because, you see, we have a major disparity in, in our officer ranks between uh, African-American or minority officers and majority officers in terms of how we view, how we're viewed the United States. In other words, there are very few minority officers in the United States Navy compared to our general population. So Navy leadership has realized if we don't look like the majority population, if we don't have the demo, if we're not mirroring the demographics of the country, and the country's demographics are changing, you all know that. So it doesn't matter whether people say they are or not, they are. The key is that if we're behind the, the boat on this thing, if we're behind the, 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 the eight ball here, we are not going to be relevant in the future. We're going to miss out on the opportunities that are going to be there. So I think that that's what's going to change a lot of the disparities in terms of how care is given and who has access to care. Care quality is not necessarily the issue that I think is as important as the access question. And that's going to have to be addressed in how we decide that we're going to finance our health care system and how we're going to give care to individuals that are the least able to pay. And that's been a big dilemma, and that's been something that the nation has struggled with because we don't know how to do that. I think one of the reasons that I stayed in the Navy is that we do not ask anyone their ability to pay when you come into our offices. We, we, that's not an issue with us. Uh, the issue with us is what's wrong with you and what can we do to help you. The question is, uh, how do you, uh, as a surgeon and as someone that is taking care of people, how do you, how do you personally deal with uh, a traumatic event in which a patient would cold, have a cardiac arrest on the operating table, and how do you put your emotions away and not become a, a very, uh, as she said, a stone cold person? Um, I think it's a wrestler. Uh, uh, but in any event. Uh, that's a great question, and I'm going to tell you what the answer is. From my, I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. I'm going to tell you what my answer is. Okay, I, I don't know the answer. Um, there are a couple of things that you need to, to do. I, I told you you got to be professionally competent, personally uh, involved, and, and spiritually involved. I said those things are because of what of that question. You see, you cannot divorce yourself from your patients in terms of emotions that are there, and yet you cannot be effective if you are overcome by every patient and every emotional experience that you have. 
So there, that means you then have to seek a balance in your life with how you deal with that. So the way you deal with that, forgive me because I think this is very important to what I was thinking. For those of you who heard that and thought that was the sort of slogan, let me tell you how it would be. The first thing you, it means is this. When I was a resident in surgery at National Naval Medical Center, my instructors really beat me up badly for five years. And I used to ask them, why are you, why are you so mean? And they, and, and they finally said, because when you leave us, you won't be able to talk to us anymore. We want to make sure you're ready to do what you need to do because you don't even have a clue as to what you're going to do. So that means you have to be professionally ready to do it. In other words, you have to be secure that you can get that care. The personal part is very important because the personal part goes to, is your family life okay? How are you getting along? You know, because a lot of the things that we do bleed over into the work that we give or the experiences that we have. Because when things are out of balance on one side, you try to put them into balance on this side. And often what happens is you don't do anything but weave a tangled web of knots, which it takes years and years and years with somebody, a lot of money for somebody to sit down and help you untangle. And the third thing is, it ain't about you. And it's not about the person. Here's, a, here's an example of what I mean it's not about you. So you come out of the operating room and your patient uh, has had a bad event or has even died. So it's your fault. Well, maybe it is your fault. Probably it isn't your fault. Or here's even a better example. So you operated on a patient, they had cancer, they had a recurrence, and they died. So why are you beating yourself? You, you didn't cause the cancer, and you didn't cause the recurrence, and you did a good operation. So why are you taking this on so much? Well, the key here is sometimes we forget that we are not the number one person. Do you, do you follow what I'm saying? We often forget that it ain't really about me. There's a family out there. There's another person out there. And there's even a God out there that's not about me. So when we don't do those things and keep them in balance, uh, we, we become less and less effective in terms of what we're trying to get done. So, so that's what I meant by that. That's the answer. Yes, sir. And then I'll come over here. Uh, the emphasis on research in military medicine. It, it's a great emphasis on research. Uh, military medicine has probably about uh, $800, uh, 800 million dollar budget, between five and $800 million a year. Uh, and there's a great deal of, of basic research, and then there's a, base, uh, there's a great deal of translational research that's going on particularly at Navy Medical Research Command and the Walter Reed Institute of Research. Uh, one example of that is that is uh, the malaria vaccines that are now being tested uh, coming out of the, Na uh, the Naval uh, Medical Center, the, uh, not National Naval Medical Center, but the Navy Research. Uh, Naval <laughs> Thank you very much. And the, I want to say NAMRI actually, the Navy Medical Research Institute. But the key is that we, we uh, it's an integral part of what we do from a military medicine point of view. It's also an integral part of what we do from a medical education point of view. So we have a great deal of clinical research going on in, in our medical centers and throughout the United States. It, it's uh, something that we, uh, we value quite highly. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. The question is, how does residency work in the military if you want to have your own private practice? When you finish your residency, you have to give back time to the military. And then at the end of your time, you know, the, I've been in 30 years, but I could have gotten out at like 12 years, 12, 13 years. So at the at 12th year, which would have been 1986 for me, which would have been, I'm sorry, 1987 for me, which was after I finished my colon and rectal, uh, I actually interviewed for different jobs as, as professor at different universities in the country uh, and decided to stay in the military. The the point is that at some point, if you want to get out, you get out and you go do private practice or go do something else. And most of us, we, we have a great many people to get out every year, so most of us don't stay. Oh, no, residency. We have residents in the military. We have a full spectrum of residencies. You name a residency, we have it within the military. And, and we have it at different institutions. Yes. So you do your residency with us. You can also do your residency outside and come into most of them, we're, we're gearing now to having you do your residency with us and then and then moving as opposed to doing it outside. But we do both. Yes, ma'am. The 
the statistics of women in military medicine. Um, the, the diversity in, in, in military medicine is the highest in the military, and that's actually because of women, because of the Navy Nurse Corps. Uh, the number of women that we have totally in the military medical department is probably 25 or 30 percent of the total department. Uh, and I'm talking, I'm talking dentists forming the whole thing. Uh, but we have uh, the women in medicine and women in the nurse corps and women in allied sciences. Uh, we have a, a tremendous number. I mean, we, we have to be probably um, among the best in the United States. And, and I will tell you, that the reason for that is because the Navy nurse corps. Because the Navy nurse corps is almost, the Navy nurse corps, I think, is 100 years old. But the, it's 108 years old. But the key is the Navy nurse corps, uh, there have been Navy nurses that have been with us forever. And so women in medicine, okay, I'm not speaking of physicians, but women in medicine, that has been there. And then women in medicine physicians have been there since uh, probably, particularly the 1970s, uh, has really come on strong. So we have uh, a number of women who are commanding officers of hospitals, who are department heads, and who are who throughout the medicine. Yes, sir. The question is, the, and if, if I don't get it right, correct me. The question is, what's the difference between military and private sector uh, medical uh, uh, physicians? In other words, how are they treated? What, what sort of life do they have and, and how they have? I think the biggest difference between private sector and military in terms of physicians, and remember, you're talking to someone who has never been on the private sector as a physician. I've only been in the military. But when I talk to my colleagues on the, on the private side, I think that two major things I want to tell you. You're going to make more money in private practice than you will in the military. Military is comparable, but you're going to make more money generally in, in private practice. And you need to look at the specialty, because many of my colleagues will tell you that's not necessarily true. But here's the thing that you can't beat, from my point of view, and that is the, the uh, what I call the discretionary time that you have in the military is much greater than private practice. Military is a huge group practice, no matter how you want to Cut it. It's not that you don't have responsibility for your patients and you take them. You do. But it's still a group practice. It depends on what sort of practice you're in and outside as to how you, how you can live. And the discretionary time that my military physicians have is much greater than you'll have as a private physician. That means time with your family and doing other things. I think those are the two biggest things. In terms of practice and how you take care of patients, there's a I mean, the, 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 the technology and the, and the things that we use You'll come from whatever civilian institutions you come to our institutions, you'll find the same things. And you'll go from our institutions to civilian. It's completely translation, I mean, uh, transfer. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. The question is, everyone in the military is given free pre prescriptions. What's the cost of that, and will that change? And the answer is, that is it, essentially that is correct. Uh, and, you know, I'll then have to dive down and say, well, what do you mean by everyone in the military? But yes, active duty and family members, uh, the, the cost of their medicine is part of the benefit that they receive from the military point of view. The cost of that is, I, 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 I can get back to you. Actually, I know some numbers, but I'd rather just not say them here because they're not going to be the right ones. Because I'm going to talk about numbers on the retired population, and I don't know what the active duty population is. But it's obviously uh, hundreds of uh, thousands of dollars, millions of dollars that we use, but that's part of the benefit that we have. Um, how will that change in the next administration? That won't change. 